Hello and welcome to the lecture on chapter 29. We're going to discuss light as waves. All right. If you recall in the last chapter, in chapter 28, we talked about light as rays. Okay. In the next chapter, we're going to talk about light as a particle, but here we're talking about light as a wave. So you can really think of it as rays, waves, and particles. Rays were not really a true property of light. It was just a way of, of, of conceptualizing angles. That's the angle of reflection and the angle of, of a refraction, the bending of light when we change the speed of light. And so it was just a helpful simplification. Now that we're talking about light as a wave, we truly are going to be talking about a property of light. And we've seen this before because we've seen before that light is an E, basically an EM wave. Right? We saw at the very end of our chapter on induction in Faraday's law that, in, that indeed waves a self-propagating self wave because a changing magnetic field creates a changing electric field and changing electric field creates, creates a changing magnetic field and so on. In fact, it, it does have an origin. It starts with the changing uh, magnetic field. Excuse me. Starts, yeah, well, I mean, yes, it does because it's the, it's the acceleration of a charged particle that then creates the changing magnetic field and thus creates the self-propagation of light. So we've seen this idea. It was you know, probably a little, little of a bit of a strange idea. But now we're really just going to talk about the consequence, the consequences, I guess, of light as a wave. How, how does it manifest in experimentation? Okay. So to get there, we're going to cover a principle, kind of lay the, the theoretical groundwork called Huygens' principle. Uh, it's, it's going to sound a little stuffy, but it's definitely important for making sure that we're you know, covering our bases, we have a good starting point. Then we're going to really get into the idea of diffraction. Diffraction will apply to any wave. You can see this in, in ocean waves. Basically, this idea, if you have some wave, and maybe these are all the crests of a wave, and then you have some opening, maybe like an opening to a bay or something, the waves spread out when they go into that, that larger region. The ability to, for waves to spread out is diffraction and is based on Huygens' principle. So that's, and that again applies to all waves. Sound waves do it, ocean waves do it, and light waves certainly do it. Okay? Then we'll talk about superposition and interference. We've seen these properties for waves before. We've seen it for sound waves. It led to things like standing waves on a string. Um, here it's going to create patterns of light and dark spots on a screen that the light is being projected onto. But you can really think of those patterns of light and dark as being completely analogous to nodes and antinodes, right? Because really, you know, like we saw before, you know, with sound waves, that the main consequence of interference was nodes and antinodes. And here, we're not going to call them that, but we're going to have bright spots and dark spots. And it's the same idea. It's regions of constructive and destructive interference, okay? And then finally, we're going to talk about polarization. And polarization is interesting because polarization is something we haven't seen before because it doesn't work with sound. And sound is really the only wave that we really focused on. And it was truly, we talked about, you know, waves on a string, which were a transverse wave. But when we talked about waves in a tube or, you know, the properties that sound does when it just propagates to open space, that was all a longitudinal wave. And I remember longitudinal waves have a, have a displacement that's parallel to the velocity. Transverse waves have a displacement that's perpendicular to the velocity. That's why, like, on a, on a string, the up and down motion is perpendicular to the actual, the actual propagation of the energy, which is, would be left to right. And, and light waves are like the waves on a string, not like sound waves in air, because they, they, they apply to a displacement, in this case, an EM displacement, that is perpendicular to the, to the actual direction of the speed of light, okay? Um, but my point, before I get too off topic here, is that polarization only happens with transverse waves, and it doesn't really apply to waves on a string because they're so confined. And polarization is, is an interesting property, and we'll see it at the end of this chapter. Okay? And we're not co covering um, holography. I decided to, stip, to skip it. Okay? All right. So let's cover our bases and talk about Huygens' principle. So let's imagine throwing a rock into a quiet pool, and the waves appear along the surface of the water. Right? They're spreading out along the surface of the water, all those, those wave fronts. Huygens' principle proposes that the wave fronts of light um, spreading out from a point source can be regarded as the overlapping crests of tiny secondary waves. All right? So the wave fronts are made up of tinier wave fronts. This idea is called Huygens' principle. And we I think we have a picture of it here. Okay? So the idea is if you consider the wave front, like the ripples on that pond, here's, here's like one big ripple. Well, you could divide that ripple up into an infinite number of little wave sources. Okay, almost like every one of these is a separate rock dropped into the water, a much smaller rock, because every one of these separate sources then creates its own ripple. Okay, but if you have an infinite number of these separate sources, then you would have an infinite number of overlapping wave fronts until the next major wave front is actually just composed of an infinite number of those smaller individual wave fronts. You know, it's like it seems to be overcomplicating an idea of, okay, yeah, sure, you know, the waves are spreading out. But it's so crucial to think of it this way because when you have all of these individual potential sources, because that's the way they're acting like, they're like pseudo sources. They all can behave like a tiny pebble dropped into the water. 
that allows us to understand how waves can bend. Because otherwise, you know, if this if this is just a rigid construct, if this wave front is it and that and it just spreads out, then if it runs into obstruction, then that's it. It just then you've just broken off part of the wave and the rest of the wave will just continue on without that broken piece. But that's not what waves do. When they hit an obstruction, they spread back out to fill the available space. And the only way to conceptualize that is to think of every single wavefront as composed of an infinite number of potential wave sources. Okay? But, uh, secondary wavelets. So let's, let's uh, think of a, a demonstration. So plane waves can be generated in water by su um, successively diff dipping a horizontal held straight edge into the surface. So here, um, this person is basically raising this board up and down and then creating these nice, these nice uniform waves. You can kind of imagine the motion, right? Going up and down, up and down. That's creating waves. The waves are then propagating out away from the board. And then they're going to hit this obstruction, basically a wall with an opening. What's going to happen in the, is the waves are going to pass through that opening and then they're going to diffract based on Huygens principle. They're going to diffract and fill the available space. See it? And here are some pictures of that happening. All right. So as the width of the opening is narrowed, less of the incident wave is transmitted. Okay. The spreading of the waves into the shadow region becomes more pronounced. So that's actually interesting. If the wave opening is very large, then you're still going to get some diffraction, but it's kind of at these, but there's a big, there's a big horizontal region. And there's a little bit of that spreading effect. It is, it is filling in the available space. But if you force the wave to go through a very small opening, and that, the concept here is if the opening becomes comparable to the wavelength, because the wavelength would be, would be the distance between crests. I'm going to zoom in a bit on this. So you imagine that this right here is your wavelength, the distance between successive crests. Well, then if that opening is comparable to the wavelength, then you get very pronounced diffraction. You basically get this almost like circular spread. You don't, you don't just see, you know, like a basically planar waves with little curved edges, like in this case over here. Instead, you see very circular, nice, very uniform diffraction pattern. And what's nice about this sort of circular diffraction pattern is it can lead to some calculations that then can be confirmed of experimentation. This one is much harder to calculate, and so you don't see it show up in terms of the iconic experiments. This one is much easier to calculate because we can expect it to have, kind of have this, this, this circular spread so we can use trigonometry to, to expect where to see certain behavior. Okay? So, diffraction. Diffraction is the consequence of Huygens' principle. Okay, so Huygens' principle is the, is the kind of the, the what if, you know, what if the waveform was composed of wavelets, you know, oh, okay, and then like, and then that explains how, how you know, waves can bend. And then diffraction is the actual, the actual you know, the, the experimental evidence of that principle. Okay, so it is the bending of waves by means other than reflection and refraction. Okay, so it absolutely does involve bending because the waves are, after all, spreading out. They are bending, okay? But they're not bending because the, the speed changed, okay? They're, and they're not, they're not bending because they, they ran into um, a reflective surface and got bounced back the other way, okay? They're bending because of Huygens principle. Now, what's interesting, interesting is that if you're wondering, you're like, oh, so you need Huygens principle only for diffraction, but the other types of wave bending, namely reflection and refraction, can, you know, be, they work on their own. That, that's actually not true. Huygens principle applies to all three types of, of bending, reflection, refraction, and diffraction. We just didn't really need it to explain um, reflection and, re and refraction, so we left it off. Some, some textbooks, more complicated physics textbooks, will use it. They'll say, they'll start with Huygens' principle and then sp explain the three types of bending. So there actually is a much more cohesive story there, but you know, we're, we're kind of explaining things when necessary, okay? So the property is a property of all kinds of waves, so sound waves, ocean waves, and light waves, certainly. And we can see it here around the, um, the edges of shadows. So this is actually a razor blade. And they're basically, this would be like shining a laser through the razor blade, some nice, some nice light source. And we can actually see the, the consequence of the diffraction patterns in these successive bright and dark lines. You can really see the patterns in here and see the, pa the patterns mirror the shape of the razor blade itself. Okay, see that? So that's what's called a diffraction pattern. Okay, it's also called an interference pattern because it requires the interference of waves. Because remember, when waves superimpose, if they're both crests, then they, then they constructively, you know, superimpose. If one is a crest and another is a trough, then they cancel each other out, and that's destructive. Okay, review the, the chapters on waves if this doesn't sound familiar, because this is, this, I, I, this is crucial information that I'm assuming you remember. Okay, so, diffraction continued. So waves diffract after passing through a narrow opening. So again, you want it to be comparable to the wavelength, okay? So you want your opening, we'll call that D, to be sort of similar to the wavelength lambda, okay? All right, so these, these are just the same pictures, okay? 
And the amount of diffraction depends on the wavelength of the wave compared to the size of the obstruction that, that, that casts the shadow. Okay? So if, it's very, you know, if we have something very large here compared to the wavelength, here in this case this is much larger than the wavelength, L or whatever you want to call it, is larger than lambda, then you don't get that much diffraction, you get a little. Here we get something that's pretty comparable, right? So here we have an R, like a, a or maybe a diameter or a radius, and that's going to be uh, comparable to, the, um, to lambda. Um, on the other hand, if you have something that is much, much larger, so in this case, you know, here I'll actually call it D because it is a diameter. In this case, the diameter is much larger than the wavelength, then you really actually don't get, you can get almost no diffraction, okay? You can have, you can have a case where the waves don't spread in, you just get a complete shadow, okay? And this actually ties in nicely with our, our understanding of umbras and penumbras, okay? All right, so light casts a sharp shadow with some fuzziness at its edges when the opening is large compared with the wavelength of the light. And when the opening is very narrow, so comparable to the wavelength, the diffraction is more apparent and the shadow is distinctly fuzzy, okay? So here we have very narrow opening, very fuzzy shadow, very wide opening, not very fuzzy shadow, okay? All right, and I, I know it sounds a little wishy-washy, but that's, that's a great way to think about it. Okay, if the, and that's, so you start to see some interesting behavior. How do you explain this fuzziness? You know, that's the, that's the, the question. You know, that's the, that's the question an eight-year-old asks. You know, like, why is it fuzzy? Well, that's the explanation we're going to come up with. Okay? So, furthermore, features of diffraction. So limitations with, fo uh, with focusing images and optical instruments. So it does have some real-life consequences. The object about the, uh, the same size as the wavelength of light, dif the diffraction blurs. Objects smaller than the wavelength of light, you don't get an image. So diffraction creates what's called the diffraction limit, all right? And so the diffraction limit, if you've heard that before, it, it comes up a lot with, tele, um, well, more like microscopes. It basically says that you can't use a light microscope, you know, a, a, a microscope that uses visible light, one where you can just look in with your naked eye. You can't use a microscope like that to see anything smaller than the wavelength of light. And ultimately it ends up being something about two and a half times larger than the wavelength of light. Wavelength is light, of lights, it, if you remember, are on the order of 500 nanometers, which is about half a micron. So that means the smallest thing you can see with a microscope, right, with visible light, is going to be about, well, let's be conservative here, we'll say two microns, okay? And that's mu, mu m, mu for micron. So two microns, that's two millionths of a meter, and that's, that's the smallest thing you can see. Um, the naked eye, by the way, the, the actual lens in your, in your eye, not as good as, as a microscope, can distinguish things down to about 50 microns. Um, the the mic microscopes and, you know, can push that limit significantly further and show much more detail to boot. But ultimately, ultimately, if you get things like bacteria that are smaller than two microns, you simply can't see them. They're just, they're just going to be blurs. You might be able to kind of make out their blurs, but you can't see any details with them because you're beyond the diffraction limit of visible light. And that's where electron beams come in. Because electron beams, and we'll talk about this when we talk about the de Broglie wavelength, this idea that matter is waves, which is pretty cool, but we're not there yet. Well, when, when we talk about electron beams, the wavelength of electrons is much smaller than the wavelength of visible light, okay? Which is interesting, because you might think, well, isn't, isn't light, you know, super small and fundamental? Well, visible light is actually fairly large compared to a lot of other physical things. Like, they're certainly much, much larger than the atomic nucleus, you know, many orders of magnitude larger, and, and also significantly larger than most electron beams, okay? All right? All right. So, features of diffraction further continued. Electron microscopes use electric and magnetic fields to focus and magnify images, okay? But again, they're using the wave properties of electrons. Better radio reception of longer radio waves, okay? Why is that? Well, because if you have the shorter wave, uh, radio waves, then you're going to have really pronounced diffraction, okay? Um, you know, when they, uh, when they get, you know, uh, you know when, they, when they experience obstructions, like, you know, whether that's buildings or, or you know, trees or whatever it may be. Um, for dolphins, they use shorter wavelengths to get very fine detail. Okay, because they want they want to show those fine details. If they're using big waves, then they're just going to completely wash over any small like small um, you know structural variations. Okay. Okay. So that's the principle of diffraction. We kind of had to establish that that's a way that light can bend. Hopefully, it makes sense. And it's all because you know the wave front is is theoretically composed of all these little separate wave sources. Okay. I hope we're good. All right. If not, you know, review waves or whatever. But now we're going to get into what happens because of diffraction, and that's interference okay now superposition is the idea that allows for interference the idea is that waves don't bump into each other they're not like particles when waves pass over each other when they coexist at the same place in the same time they superimpose and superposition then can lead to cancellation or addition okay so if you have two waves that are in phase then you get reinforcement which is constructive interference okay constructive interference 
okay? When you have waves that are out of phase, so where a crest overlaps with a trough, then you get cancellation. That is destructive interference. So I'm just showing the other terminology because so you can call it destructive or you can call it cancellation. Or you can have something in the middle, right? Where they're not completely out of phase and they're not completely in phase and then there's partial cancellation, okay? All right, so interference patterns of overlapping waves from two vibrating sources, okay? So these, could, these are probably water waves in this case. And we can see, right, where we have crests overlap crests, we have um, some, you know, some especially high spots, and then we have spots where, they're, where they, there's basically placid water because the waves have canceled out, okay? Now, what does this have to do with waves passing through an opening? Well, when waves pass through openings and they spread out, then they, they take different path lengths to get somewhere. So imagine you have two separate openings over here, okay? Well, that's gonna create two separate sources. Then those, source, those sources then are gonna take paths shown by the dotted line here. And if they take paths that are equal in length, then when they arrive at a screen, they're going to arrive in phase and create a bright spot, okay? Because if they arrive in phase, that's constructive interference. But what if they take paths that are different in length, okay? What if their paths are not the same length? Well, if their paths are not the same length, then they're not going to arrive in phase. Imagine maybe this, this path is a slightly longer. That's why this one started off and basically as a crest here where the other one was already a trough, okay? So, you know, maybe they, they came from the same source, but they just took different length paths to get there. So then when they arrive, they arrive out of phase and they create a dark area. They cancel each other out, okay? So that's the idea how diffraction combined with the idea of wave superposition and interference leads to bright spots and dark spots, okay? So constructive interference produces bright regions where, wave, where, where waves reinforce each other. They arrive in phase, crests overlapping crests, troughs overlap, overlapping troughs. Destructive interference produces dark regions where the waves cancel each other. Okay, they arrive exactly one half a wavelength out of phase. Because if you're a full wavelength out of phase, then you're actually in phase, because it doesn't matter. Remember, any sine or cosine wave is a repeating process, okay? And a full wavelength is where you get back to where you started. So you only cancel out where you're one half wavelength out of phase. That's where a trough, a trough overlaps a crest. And I know people sometimes have an issue with that, so I'll just draw a quick picture here. So here's one complete waveform, all right? And so this is, this is one wavelength, one lambda. So if I draw another, another one on top, one that will cancel out. So there we have the crest and the trough, okay? This one's also one lambda. Well, what's the difference between them, right? What's that right there? That out of phase separation is one half lambda. See how it's exactly half the waveform? So that's one half lambda out of phase. That's, that's the condition for complete cancellation because that's where a trough overlaps a crest, okay? All right, so now the different path lengths, okay? They actually, they're actually seeing it. So here's the two openings. This is called a double slit, okay? And this creates an interference pattern. We can also call it a diffraction pattern because after all, it needs diffraction to explain the spreading of the light, right? Because if it wasn't for diffraction, then there would just be two single spots, right? That's it. There'd just be two single bright spots in the story, okay? Now, the thing is that there's not as long as the openings are comparable to the wavelength of light. So they have to be small openings, okay? They have to be just a couple nanometers in size, the opening. Now, they can actually be larger and it still works. They can, they can, they can be as large as, um, as, you know, as well, not a couple of nanometers, excuse me, a couple of microns because the light, light is after all hundreds of nanometers. I misspoke. Um, but they can actually even be up to like 50, 60, 100 microns and it still works, which is actually kind of surprising because in that case, they're, they're 10 times or even 20 times longer than the wavelength of light, but actually does still work, okay? Um, but you get, you get absolutely really, really crisp pattern um, with, with if the openings are just a couple of microns wide, okay? And here's really showing the different path lengths, right? And I know there's a lot, there's a very busy image over here, but imagine, okay, here, you know, here's the, here, here are the two openings. There's some, there's some source. When the, lights, when the light first arrives, it's in phase because it's created from the same source, okay? Like a laser. And then, right, but then, then there's different paths. So, so consider, consider this bright spot here. The idea is that from the lower opening, there is a path that is this, this one that I'm tracing right now. From the upper opening, there's the much shorter path. Okay, these are distinctive, distinctive paths. They're definitely different lengths. 
and it turns out that the difference in their path lengths, so the delta r, okay, the difference in their path lengths is going to be equal to some integer multiple of the wavelength. So let's say it's equal to three lambda, okay? So if it's equal to three lambda, that means they're gonna arrive in phase here because the path length difference is exactly equal to an integer multiple of their, of their wavelengths. So sure, it's a different path, but it ends up not mattering because it works out that they arrive in phase, creating a bright spot. But what would create this dark spot? Well, then the difference in their path lengths has to be equal to an integer multiple of a half wavelength, all right? So this one here, right? If we imagine these two path lengths, still a different path length, but the difference now, the delta R is going to be equal to one half lambda times N, okay? So the, or, you know, one half lambda plus N. The idea then is going to be, it's going to be a, an extra half wavelength. So let's say, you know, the path length difference is one and a half wavelengths or two and a half wavelengths or something like that. Any, any, any um, answer like that, five and a half, anywhere it's as something and a half is then going to cause cancellation and a dark spot. Okay. So the phenomenon of interference occurs for, right? We said this before, all types of waves, sound waves and light waves. Okay. We're just happen to be talking about light here, but this would apply to sound as well. Okay. So another way we can see interference is in what's called thin films. Okay, because the, the thin film, if it's, if it's thin enough, if, if it's kind of comparable to the wavelength of visible light, then we'll see interference because we'll again have different path lengths. Okay, and this occurs because of reflection from the upper and lower surfaces of a wedge of air between the two glass plates. It doesn't have to be glass. This is just one example of going from glass to air and then the glass. And this would be literally like taking, you know, like maybe two microscope, you know, like glass sheets and laying one on top of the other. Because they're not exactly manufactured, there might be, there might be a wedge shape between them rather than a perfect rectangle. And that means we're going to have varying lengths of path length difference. And then we can have dark fringes and light fringes depending on this variation as we go along the wedge. Okay. So there might be like, you know, a, a, a light region here and a dark region here, and then a light region and then a dark region and a light region, and then a dark region. Because we're going, we're going through having places where the path length difference is a multiple of the wavelength to where the path length difference is a half multiple of the wavelength, okay? Maybe this one's three lambda, right? So that's the idea, bright, dark, bright, dark. And so you'll see these alternating patterns, okay? And then it can also, it can also um, cancel out different colors. So when you look at gasoline sitting on water, in that case, we see cancellations of certain colors. So then the reflected light is, what, is whatever colors weren't canceled. Then it's the, you know, it's the leftover colors. So you know, if, it, if it appears red, that's because the blue light was canceled because blue obviously has a different, different path length than, um, than red, right? And so that's why when you look at gasoline sitting on water, you see a whole rainbow effect because of the varying thickness of the gasoline causes cancellations of different colors. Thus, the colors that survive are the ones that you see, the ones that weren't canceled. Okay? And of course, that only works if the light source that's hitting the gasoline on the water is white light with all the colors of the rainbow. If you, if you shown like red light on, on the gasoline, then you would just see dark and red because you, know, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't see all the different colors. It requires you know, the rainbow effect to get the different colors. Okay? You can also have what's called a diffraction grating. This is just mini openings instead of having two. What happens here when you have mini, mini openings it ends up being that the, the, the effect of having you know, regions where you have light and dark are more pronounced. So the light spots are much more centered and are very, very bright. And then the dark spots are basically everything in between. So you end up having a pattern where you just have one big bright spot, total darkness, one big spike, right? And maybe it'll make it look more like a spike, right? And so then, 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 so basically it takes that interference pattern, but makes it more dramatic. And it's really helpful then, these um, diffraction gratings, for actually finding the spectrum from certain sources. So we, you know, the idea, and we'll talk more about this, but elements have basically a atomic fingerprint due to the excitation levels of the electrons um, around the nucleus. And then so those different energy transitions correspond to different wavelengths of light because energy, because different wavelengths are tied into different energies, which we'll talk about when we talk about the photon nature of light. But importantly, then when you shine that light through a diffraction grating, you can clearly see those wavelengths and then you can measure their distance on a screen and calculate the wavelength. All right. So the thin film of gasoline was a bit thinner. The wavelength, the wavelength they canceled would be what do you think, you know? What, what would be the, the wavelength being canceled? If it's even thinner, okay? Shorter than blue. And what's shorter than blue? Ultraviolet. Maybe violet first, but violet if it's just a little bit shorter, and then if it's shorter still, ultraviolet, okay? If violet white light were canceled um, by the double reflection of sunlight from gasoline on the wet surface, the resulting color would likely be, so if you cancel out violet, what's left over? 
Okay, so you took out one end of the rainbow, you'd have orange because you basically, you'd still have the yellows, okay? You still have the green, and then you can be, you'd be combining that with all the reds, and so then you'd be left with an orange color, okay? It's a complementary color of violet, all right? So if you see the color blue reflected in an interference pattern from gasoline on water, and you lower your head so that you have a greater angle from the normal, uh, the normal, you'll likely see a cover, color having a, because now, you now you've increased the path. So before, you were, you were canceling out the, um, the red light. As you went lower, now you're canceling out something longer than red, so you're gonna see something shorter than blue. Okay, all right? So essentially violet. Here are some interference colors in a thin film, in this case, uh, um, basically the, um, the soap, the soap water mixture. All right, okay, and they're subtractive primaries. Okay, pretty cool. All right, now finally polarization, our last wave nature, okay? So the idea, okay, is that the waves are three-dimensional. Unlike a wave on a string where you can really draw it as like a 2D thing, the w actual light wave is transverse, but it's transverse in all directions. So essentially it's got all these different planes that would all look like this. So these, like this sine wave would then get superimposed on any one of these planes, see? Something like this, okay? Get the idea, okay? So that's, that's the 3D nature of light. It's kind of hard to visualize, but that's, that's, that's what light looks like. And when a light looks like this, it's called unpolarized light because it's light in every direction. That's the kind of light that is produced by the sun, all right? So um, basically incandescent lamps, fluorescent lamps, candle flames, they all produce unpolarized light. So does the sun. sun produces unpolarized light. And that's due, be, due to the way that the light is produced from, from random vibrations of charged particles in every direction. Thus, the, the, the light has components in every direction. So it's completely omnidirectional light, okay? But then we can have, you know, we can then polarize that light. And by the way, we want the way we represent unpolarized light, this would be the most complex way, try, tr trying to draw it so it looks 3D. And I suppose if you actually add the sine waves like I have, you make it look even more complex. But then you can simplify it into just kind of being projected onto the page. But since you only really care about the fact that there is both an X and Y component, since all of these would just have, you know, some, you know, some X and Y components, right? X and Y, right? Or, the, you know, these are the X and Y axes. This would have, you know, some component of X and Y then you can simplify it just as an X and Y axis. So this is the simplest way of representing unpolarized light. Okay, so now let's imagine we have unpolarized light. Okay, so it's got both horizontal and vertical components. Okay, non-polarized or unpolarized. And I, I use those interchangeably, non-polarized or unpolarized. Your book prefers non-polarized. Okay, so it comes in, but then if we shine it through essentially a barrier that has openings that are only horizontal or vertical, then we polarize the light. So notice here, I'm gonna zoom in on this, this part of the picture. If, there's, if there is barriers that have basically vertical slits, almost like a diffraction grating, then we're only allowing the vertical component to pass, all right? So what we've done is we've polarized the light. We've eliminated the horizontal component because essentially it rams up against the opening and isn't able to pass. We can think of an analogy of like having a, a, a picket fence and, and you know, like swinging a rope, maybe having two people that hold the rope on both ends and having them, you know, kind of vibrate that rope up and down. If they try to do it side to side, all that's going to happen is it's just going to hit the fence and not go anywhere. Okay, or if you have a fence that you know has vertical slats like this, and then the next fence um, has horizontal slats, and then the two people are trying to vibrate the rope up and down, well, the person over here is going to find it unsuccessful because they're just going to be hitting hitting the rope against the sides, and the rope's not going to go anywhere. So they've taken the vertical polarized light or vertical vertical polarized rope, and then basically canceled it out. So now there's base, there's no vibration left. They they've completely eliminated the wave because that's something you can do with polarization. You can just cancel the light, okay? Case in point, right, right here, we have unpolarized light going through a vertical polarizer and then passing through a horizontal polarizer, and the final effect is no light at all, right? Just darkness, okay? The wave, the wave has been eliminated. Here, here's an example of that with some different polarizers. If you have two polarizers that are both vertical and you hold them one in front of each other, you get some dimming effect because there's inevitably some absorption, but then if you turn one the other sideways, now you have this effect here, you have one horizontal and one vertical, and so where they overlap is complete darkness. Interestingly, and this is so cool, it's like a magic trick, if you then have one sideways and one vertical, so here this one is vertical, this one is horizontal, and then you introduce a third one that is at an angle, okay, so some angle theta, between the horizontal and vertical polarizers, you actually bring the light back, okay? Um, this, this, is, uh, this works with, um, 
with if you ever seen one of those like those um the like the the magic lamp books for kids where you hold you you slide something between underneath like a plastic sheet and it allows you to see something that otherwise was almost completely un unseeable it's this exact this exact idea you're introducing a, thir a third polarizer between between two two separate ones okay and the reason then is the the kind of the quick explanation for that is the first the first polarizer the hor horizontal one horizontally polarizes light the second angled one then polarizes the light reintroducing a vertical component so then when the when it hits the third vertical um polarizer there actually is a vertical component so the light isn't completely canceled then there's just a little bit of light that passes through whatever was the vertical component so the, the angled polarizer can reintroduce a component that was eliminated by the initial horizontal polarizer okay so polarization occurs for waves that are okay i said this at the very beginning of the lecture okay translational or transverse only that type okay they do not work for longitudinal waves. You cannot polarize longitudinal waves. And there's only really one important type of longitudinal waves with the sound waves. So there's no such thing as sound polarization. All right. Well, that's it for our discussion of light as a wave. Hopefully some interesting ideas with the diffraction patterns, the thin film interference, and polarization. Okay. Thank you so much for watching.